Okay, so mine's gonna be a little less interesting than Dr. Ahmad's. I don't have a shoulder to show you that I dissected, um, but we'll get going here with some biomechanics in the shoulder. Hope this works. How are you advancing this slide? How are you advancing this? All right. All right, so I have no disclosures. So as just mentioned, Dr. Ahmad talked about the anatomy, so I'll skip over that and we'll just skip on to the biomechanics. And we talk about biomechanics a lot as it relates to the shoulder, and everybody has a little different understanding of what biomechanics actually means. And if you look it up, it basically says the study of mechanical laws as it relates to movement of a structure of living organism. So for the purposes of our talk today, we're gonna talk about the shoulder. And so when we think about the shoulder, we really know that its main function is to position the arm in space. Now, whether it's grabbing your cup of coffee in the morning or putting your arm in abduction, external rotation to throw a baseball, your shoulder's function is to position your arm in a certain position. And it has four joints, as Dr. Ahmad talked about. And the two that we'll really focus on today are the glenohumeral and the scapulothoracic. Not to diminish what the AC and the SC joints do, but as far as the throwing motion is concerned, it's mostly the glenohumeral and the scapulothoracic joints that need to work in concert for you to be able to effectively throw. And so when you think about throwing, when you think about the shoulder, we have to really think about the whole kinetic chain, because we know the shoulder is just one part, it's actually the end part of really the throwing motion that starts at the lower extremities and works its way up. And there's a significant amount of torque and tension and velocity that goes into the shoulder and elbow every time you throw. It's about 7,600 roughly degrees per second is what the shoulder sees as it's going into the acceleration phase, and the elbow is more like 2,500. So there's a lot of force that goes across the shoulder when it's throwing. But as I mentioned, the throw, is more than just the shoulder, it's the kinetic chain. So if you look at Aroldis Chapman reaching 105 miles an hour in a fastball, there's more to it than him just getting his shoulder in the proper position. He has to start with his stride length. So he has to have his stride length that's actually 120% of what his height is. You can see most pitchers are around 87%. He gets up to 120% of what his height is. His stride speed, he's much faster than the majority of pitchers. His hip to shoulder separation, which is something we're gonna talk about a little bit throughout the course of this meeting, which has become more and more something that we focused on in regards to pitching injury prevention and fatigue and things like that. Usually pitchers, when they throw, their back shoulder is behind their midline a certain percentage. His is about 65% behind, which is a lot more than average. And then he accelerates in that acceleration phase much faster than most pitchers, about twice as fast. And so I want to just break down the pitching cycle, and we'll go through each phase individually. So when we talk about the wind-up phase, it really starts when the pitcher starts moving and ends when their knee gets to their maximum height. So you can see here, that's basically the end of the wind-up phase. And there's not really much going on from the shoulder and elbow in this, in this uh, phase. You see a little bit of trapezius and serratus and deltoid muscle activation. And what I have on here, MVIC, that's your maximal voluntary isometric contraction, so how much your muscle can contract. So really, you're only looking at 18 to 20 percent of what the muscles can actually do in this phase. And so when we move on to the early cocking phase, this is when we start to see a little more activation. So this starts where the last one picked off, similar to all the phases. So it starts at max knee flexion height, ends when the front foot hits the ground. And in this phase, the shoulder starts to come into what I call kind of the semi cock position. So it's 90 degrees abducted, but it's really not externally rotated yet. Every pitcher is a little bit different in how much external rotation they get at the start of this phase. And you see the supraspinatus and deltoid working here. But more importantly, you see the scapula working here. So the muscles of the scapula, the middle trap, the rhomboid, the levator, and the serratus really have to put the glenoid and the scapula in the proper position to make a stable foundation and a stable base for the humus to rotate against. So if the scapula is not in the proper position, you can think of the foundation of the shoulder not being actually where it needs to be. So it kind of affects things down the road. So in this, so in this particular phase, it's really important for the scapula to be in the proper position. And then as well, you see a lot of things for the lower extremity going on here. Um, and you can see here his pitcher throwing. Basically, his knee was at his max height. He doesn't flex his knee very high. And as he starts to bring his arm back and up, he brings his lead leg forward. And as his front foot hits the ground, you can see his shoulder, his back shoulder still turned back past midline, and his arm's kind of in that semi cocked position. Then we move on to the leg cocking phase. And this is where we always talk about pitchers getting injured, leg cocking, early acceleration. The leg cocking phase is really from when that foot touches the ground to when your shoulder hits its max external rotation, which for me is 90 degrees, but in pitchers is more like 120 to 160 degrees. And in this phase, there's a lot of different things going on. So you have some of the scapular muscles and the pec muscles active kind of to keep the shoulder concentrically reduced. You have the external rotators working to get the shoulder maximally externally rotated. And then you have the subscap and the biceps working to kind of keep the humeral head centered. And we're not exactly sure what the biceps does, 
But we have an idea that what it wants to do here is to compress the humeral head against the glenoid, so to prevent any type of micro motion where we don't want it to go. Things like internal impingement can happen when the humeral head rides a little too high, so the biceps helps to depress the humeral head. Uh, and then again, you see the scapula being important here. So the scapula in this part has to make enough space between the humeral head and the acromion so that when you come into that abducted externally rotated position, the humeral head doesn't bang into the acromion. So you have to make sure that there's enough clearance there, which is putting the scapula in that position of retraction to make sure this happens. And you can see here, it's a very quick phase. It's not as fast as the next phase we'll talk about, but it's pretty rapid. And so when that shoulder gets into that maximally externally rotated position, that's kind of the end of the leg cocking phase. And then we get into the acceleration phase, which is very quick. It's only a couple of milliseconds, and it really starts from that maximally externally rotated position to ball release. This is hands down the most explosive phase. It's actually not the most violent phase, but it's the most explosive phase. And you see the internal rotators like the subscap and like the latissimus that Dr. Romeo will talk about later, uh, really very active during this phase. And as we move on to the deceleration phase, this is when you see ball release to maximal shoulder internal rotation. So the internal rotators are still very active, um, but you're seeing a lot of shoulder compressive forces during this phase. So if you think about it, the pitcher has generated so much force to release that ball, now your body has to slow down the arm. In order to slow down the arm, you basically have to prevent it from not coming off your body. So the internal rotators are very active here. You have to have a lot of compressive forces coming across the shoulder, almost to about 100 pounds worth of force that compresses the glenoid, excuse me, it compresses the humeral head into the glenoid. So it's almost like reaching over your head with a 100 pound dumbbell and holding it up like this with one arm. So that's kind of what you see in the deceleration phase. So there's a lot of compressive forces and shear forces that are going on here. The posterior structures in your shoulder also see a lot of force here as well. And that's actually one of the reasons that we think we see posterior capsular tightness. So we always talk about internal rotation deficit, the posterior structures are tight. Well, the deceleration phase actually stresses those structures a great deal. It's about 40 to 50% your body weight worth of shear force going on the back of your shoulder during this phase. And so over time, those tissues become less compliant, they become tighter, and then we start seeing pitchers lose some of their internal rotation, and then we can see problems down the road with that. And finally, I'll just show you the deceleration phase. You can see how much motion is there in the arm. You can see his arm moving side to side. And then Finally, we kind of end with the follow-through phase. This is really from max internal rotation to when the body stops moving. And in this phase, there's really not much going on with the shoulder. You've already decelerated the shoulder, so there's not much else going on. So really, you know, just to summarize, throwing mechanics, shoulder mechanics, it's all related to the kinetic chain. It starts at the lower extremity, works its way up, and having things in proper positions actually will help decrease injury and help pitchers, help pitchers pitch efficiently. The scapula is very important. Having a stable base for anything you do is always the most important thing. So having the scapula in the proper position, having it be the foundation for what the glenohumeral joint uses to rotate around is extremely important. And proper mechanics. We're going to talk about mechanics throughout the course of this, or throughout the course of the next two days. And we're going to see how mechanics can potentially um, decrease or increase injury rates based on how pitches are throwing.